God's grace, his mercy, and his peace be multiplied to you in the precious name of his Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. I'd like to share with you a few thoughts based on the gospel lesson for this day. In that gospel lesson, in verse 24, Jesus says he must. Now, he had talked about his suffering being betrayed and his death and his resurrection before. But now he knows it's imminent, it's near. He said he must. There is an urgency about it now. He knows that he is on his way to the cross. He knows he is on his way to do the Father's will, to give his life in a sacrifice so that our sins could be forgiven and we could have fellowship with God and eternal life. He's preparing his disciples for his death and for his resurrection. But they don't comprehend, they don't get what he's trying to do. And in verse 22, we read where Peter takes Jesus aside and he says, Lord, this is never going to happen to you. It seems so unlikely to Peter that Jesus, the Messiah, would have to suffer, would die at the hands of the leaders. And Peter's words were to Jesus like the words of Satan after he had been baptized. When he went into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil to try to take some other path other than the path that God had set before him to do the Father's will totally and completely. Jesus responds to Peter, it's God's way, not your way. Here Peter is like a rock out of place. He's like a stumbling stone instead of a building rock. And then in verse 24, we see Jesus committing himself let me read that verse 24. Then Jesus says to his, said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Not my will, but God's will. In Gethsemane, when Jesus prayed, the Gospel writers said that his heart was very heavy and his sweat was like blood. So intense was his feeling. And the thing that he dreaded was not being nailed to a cross. The thing that he dreaded was taking on the sins of the world all of my sins, all of your sins, all of the sins of all mankind. The most haunting words of scripture for me is when Jesus on the cross cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's what hell is. He experienced something incomprehensible to us as human beings. He experienced separation from his father. They were one for all eternity. The three in one, never divided, never separated, except in that moment when he took on our sin and the sins of the world. We want to be a disciple of Jesus. Not my will. Father. 
calling a pastor. the Lord, one who loves the word of God. take up their cross. I'd like to ask you a question may not ever invite me back after I ask you this question. But do you think of yourself as being a saint or a sinner? <laughs> There's a hand that went up. <laughs> a young man back there. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you ever listened to Garrison Keeler on Prairie Home Companion. Remember that program? Oh, it was a number of years ago. And he used to have fun with Lutherans. He broadcast from Minnesota. A lot of Lutherans in Minnesota, unlike in the South, where there are few of us, fewer of us. And he said, Lutherans like to feel guilty. It makes them feel good. I ask you this because what is your identity? Is your identity as a sinner or is your identity as a saint? Now John is very clear in his epistles. In 1 John he says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourselves and the truth is not in you. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes to the congregation in Corinth. And he says, Count your, he said, If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. In Romans chapter 6, Paul's great chapter on baptism, Paul reminds us that when we are baptized, we are united with the death of Christ, we are united with the burial of Christ, and we are united with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus paid the price for our sins. I'm impressed that so many of the epistles, in many of the translations, say to the saints at Corinth. That was the most messed up congregation that Paul wrote to. I mean, they were, they were in all kinds of weird stuff that Paul had to recenter them and refocus them on the ways of God. And yet he says to the saints at Corinth, or some translations say, to those called to be holy. God has declared that you are his righteousness. Now, does that mean you don't sin? No. No. We all fail. We all, it, it, it's important for us to confess our sins. I'm, I'm very thankful in our tradition that we begin our services with a confession. I must say to you, I personally struggle sometimes with some of the confessions we have. It sounds more like a person who was not a believer. I do believe we have to confess our sins. I retired from Resurrection Lutheran Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we were there for a number of years and it was my privilege to serve as a vacancy pastor congregations that were vacant. And one was Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, an African-American congregation. I'd never served in an African-American congregation. 
And I remember telling the young people when it was Black History Month, I said, I want you to teach myself and Gretchen what black history is all about. And what they did is they interviewed some of the members there who were some of the early people who brought forth civil rights in Charlotte. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But I do remember we were using the LBW, the Lutheran, uh, LBW, Lutheran Worship uh, Service, Lutheran Worship Book, uh, Lutheran Book of Worship. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> and I remember I told them, I said, you know, I really struggle with this confession that we use. And I said, could we maybe do a little bit different confession? And they said, oh, sure, Pastor. What do you want to do? And I said, well, how will it be if at the beginning of our service, we ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts? And if there's anything that the Spirit brings up that we need to confess before God, that we silently confess it. And then I said, then I'd like to ask three questions. I'd like to ask the people of God, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior who died upon the cross for your sins? If so, answer, I believe. And you believe that it is only by the power of his shed blood that our sins can be washed away and we can be cleansed and forgiven. Our sins are removed from us as far as the east is from the west and he remembers them no more. If so, answer, I believe. And are you willing, not by your own strength or by your own determination, to live a life that is pleasing to God, but by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, to live a life that is pleasing to God? If so, answer, yes, with the help of God. And then I pronounced God's forgiveness, as we do in our services here as well. So, some of the things that stand out to me in this text. Being a believer means having a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not all up here. Doctrine is important. It's important to have biblical doctrines. It's important that the church have biblical teachings. But it's also important what's in our hearts. That we don't just have head knowledge of God, we have heart knowledge of God. We love Him and want to honor Him, want to please Him, want to live for Him, want to do His will. Next, we have a new identity. Our identity is we are now saints who sin. I'm impressed that nowhere in the Bible do I see God calling his children sinners. Now, does he call sin, sin? Absolutely. But our identity is no longer as sinners. Our identity is with Jesus, with the cross, with the righteousness that he has made us, that he has won for us and that he has made us. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's your identity. You are his sons. You are his daughter. You are the beloved children of God. None of it is our doing. Not a single bit of it is our doing. He has done it all. From the cross he said, it is finished. It is complete. The work of redemption has been, has been done. It has been accomplished. And at the end of the gospel, Jesus says in verse, Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. They did see 
the glory of God, especially Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. But then they also saw Jesus ascend back into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, the one who's coming back again. Well, there are three things I'd ask you to consider to take home from this sermon today. Number one, that your faith is a personal relationship with God. It's in your heart. I remember asking one of the children at a children's sermon, and I said, where is Jesus? And one of the children went, and I thought, we all go, he's up there. Child says, it's in my heart, it's in my life, he's in me. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Number two, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He has called you a saint. We have not identified ourselves as being sinless, holy, but God has said, because of my spirit who dwells in you, you are my people. You are my, my righteousness is yours. I have clothed you with a robe of righteousness. I think how wondrous that is. When everyone comes to church, we should give them a white robe. That's what the book of Revelation says we're going to have. Robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That robe of righteousness. And finally, a desire to live according to God's will. And God pours out his Holy Spirit upon us to lead us in his way, to lead us in his will, to be God-pleasing people because we love him, we want to serve him, we want to honor him, we want to glorify him. Well, I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to be here with you this morning I rejoice in the process that you are in your calling of a pastor. Gretchen and I, my wife and I, we pray for Augustana. We pray for the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you in the calling of this under-shepherd. The Lord bless you in Jesus' precious and holy name.